Hello. 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 <laughs> uh, can everyone hear me? I was told to project. <laughs> I don't often do so. Uh, so I think what, what I'll do is I'll just read for a little bit. Yeah, I think the plan is you're going to read for a little bit and then we'll have a conversation and then we'll turn questions over to you guys, the audience. Um, yeah, so do you want to start? I will start. Okay, great. I will start. And I'll keep this short. I know you want to get to the conversation. Yeah. You're on mic up here. All right, so this is um, the first chapter. Uh, from Everywhere You Don't Belong. It came out on Tuesday. And I'm just going to read some short sections uh, from the beginning of the book. And then we'll jump into this thing. So this chapter is called Euclid Avenue. If there's one thing wrong with people, Paul always said, it's that no one remembers the shit that they should and everyone remembers the shit that doesn't matter for shit. I remember Euclid Avenue. I remember yelling outside our window, coming in from the street, grandma putting down her coffee. I remember grandma holding my ankle, swinging my two-year-old self out the front door, flipping me right side up, plopping me down next to the Hawaiian violets plopping herself down next to me. I remember awe and disbelief. Dad was on the curb, wrestling another man. He had the man's head, the man's life and soul, between his thighs. Upstairs, above our heads, mom screamed for the men to stop, to regain their senses, civilize themselves. Your friends, mom yelled. You go to church. Say it again, dad told the man. I'm sorry, the man told dad. Sorry for what? Dad asked the man. Sorry for saying you look like Booker T. Washington, <laughs> the man told dad. Dad loosened his grip on the man. Chicago cops came speeding down our street before dad's loafer could dislodge the man's teeth. Gentlemen, dad told the cops, after noticing me sitting there, applauding, not in front of my son. The cops shook their heads at this ridiculous black on black crime. Your brothers, the cops said, you're on the same side. The man on the ground stood up, brushed grass and dirt off his jeans, wiped his bloody and twisted nose on his torn shirt sleeve, adjusted his purple and blue floral tie, adjusted his large silver belt buckle. He stared at me, this man I hadn't seen before and would never see again. He had a sad face, on his tongue, something important and tragic, a forever buried secret. Then Paul ran out with a fireplace poker, with his robe open and his belly fat rippling. That's it, Grandma said. Enough culture for one day. <laughs> no one pressed charges. When the cops came around asking, no one had seen anything. It never happened. Um, so there's one more short short little beginning to a larger piece about a young friendship. Um, this one's called Bubbly and Nugget. Miss Bev asked if our parents loved us. She was crying again. We always said yes when she cried. When the divorce started, she brought three lunches to class, eating them throughout the day. That's good, she said. Love is good. She put her head on the table and bid us to leave. We were nine. We didn't have anywhere to go. There was a foot of snow outside. Bubbly leaned over and whispered to me, I think she's going to kill herself. How do you kill yourself? I asked. I loved Bubbly. She stuck a finger up her nose and ate what she found. My parents think she's going to kill herself, she said. 
Nugget smiled, showed us an eraser in his mouth. She's just sad, Nugget said, over the eraser, spit coming down his chin. Haven't you guys ever been sad? Bubbly raised a fist at Nugget. Fear confused Nugget. Back then, he couldn't tell fear from sadness. When he got older, he found out. He jumped out of a plane. His parachute didn't open. It was on the news. He took the eraser out of his mouth and rolled it between his palms. Nugget bubbly said, you smell like bologna. Thank you, he said, and turned around. Nugget loved bologna. You're nice, I said to Bubbly. I was going to ask Bubbly to marry me, but Principal Big Ass walked in. His real name was Gene Longley IV. Mrs. Beverly, Principal Big Ass said, may I speak with you in the hall? It's Miss Bev, Nugget said. What was that, Jeffrey? Principal Big Ass asked. It's Nugget, Bubbly said. What, Tiffany? He asked. <laughs> it's bubbly, I said. Claude, his face turned purple. Yeah, that's right, Nugget said. Everybody laughed. Nugget put the eraser back in his mouth. I didn't want a nickname. Nugget and bubbly didn't like their normal selves. Once, earlier in the year, I spilled an apple juice carton on Miss Bev's rug underneath the upside down world map with Africa and South America twice as large as America and Europe. After that, Nugget and Bubbly wanted to call me Nigerian Juice Man. That name was too long to catch on, and it wasn't me. Miss Bev followed Principal Big Ass into the hall. She looked at us over her shoulder before closing the door. See, Nugget, Bubbly said, that's fear. I think I'm always afraid, Nugget said. I know, Nugget, Bubbly patted his back. I know. Okay. Yes, please, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great, congratulations on Thanks. the book. Um, so, you know, the book, you have an extraordinary voice for the main character called McKay Love. <laughs> and so what I really loved is that the voice spears between sort of describing these really sort of sad or sort of wrenching or sort of lonely things. And then there's also this really sharp humor. I think we heard some of that um, when you were reading. And so can you talk a little bit about writing between those two tones, or writing around and in between those two tones, um, and sort of how you came to um, decide to tell the story in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess first I'd like to say it's really awesome, like, being up here with you. Uh, <laughs> like, I read, uh, I read We Love You, Charlie Freeman, like, in grad school. Uh, oh, wow. When I, got the, <laughs> when I got the call from uh, Kathy Poirier about joining, or maybe like signing off with Algonquin. Oh, great. She worked with you in Algonquin. I said, let's do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> Alexa can attest to that. Um, but yeah, I think the voice, uh, and, like moving between drama and, and comedy, uh, wasn't something like I thought about intentionally, mm -hmm. like in the writing. Um, I knew I wanted to have uh, like a nice blend of characters in the book. Mm -hmm. I think like with the kids, like Bubbly, Nugget, and Claude, um, you know, Claude's kind of the straight man yeah. in all this, right? And, uh, Nugget is kind of like the wacky, sad sack, mm -hmm. and uh, Bubbly uh, is kind of like tough, right? Like tough and no nonsense. Um, and I think having those characters just like interacting mm -hmm. in various situations like can create comedy, right? Like uh, when they're just being themselves, like and when the moment strikes, it can be funny. Yeah. Right? Like, I, don't, I don't think there's a single time when I was writing this book that I thought like I was writing a joke. Mm -hmm. something I thought I was writing. Something I was just having people talk the way I thought they'd talk. Mm -hmm. But you know it's funny, right? There's <laughs> the humor I mean, I mean, there. I mean, it's yeah. really wonderful yeah, humor. Yeah. It's my favorite kind of humor when I'm reading fiction, which is sort of, it feels really close to real life. 
um, and really close to sort of how we experience situations and and that veer between really sad for us, but we can sort of like see the comedy in it as well. Um, and it's really, it's yeah, it's really lovely. It's really great. Well, and like a lot of it's just timing. Yeah. Right, too. So it's like when... Uh, when someone points out that uh, like nugget smells like bologna, mm-hmm. right? like if that timing, if it's later in the section or not, when they're talking about something kind of so serious, mm-hmm. right, then uh, it, the joke doesn't land. Or something. Did you yeah. read um, out loud to yourself to make sure you got that timing while you were writing, or how does that work when you're sort of? Uh, I guess kind of like when, especially with dialogue, like I can always hear it. Like mm-hmm. in my head, which kind of sounds crazy. I guess. <laughs> so it's like it's, it's just like people talking in your head, yeah, right? and you're yeah. transcribing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I'm. I just like Nugget. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't think it was like a ha ha laugh. I was like, oh man, Nugget, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> um, Claude has sort of this wonderful constellation of a community around him. He has these friends, um, both at this school, and then as he moves to these other sort of locations throughout the novel and then he has this extraordinary grandmother and um uh and family friend paul (laughs) who's never been in their house with them we have this grandma and paul also have this very beautiful and sort of spontaneous and very funny friendship on the page um and i really sort of appreciated this sort of alternative family that comes around claude with you know um his parents sort of being not being really in the picture as much. And he has this relationship with his grandmother that is um, uh, both sort of mystifying to him as a kid, but, you know, reading as an adult, you can sort of see the real love between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about building that character of grandma first and then um, uh, sort of constructing that sense of family for your characters when you're writing. Yeah, and... um... I think the the book started with uh, like just Grandma and Claude as characters. Mm-hmm. Right? The first kind of short story I messed around with, um, they were the main characters, and then everyone else kind of like filled in. After I think it was like Paul next, uh, and the Grandma character is like someone modeled off of uh, like my grandmother, who's actually like from Harlem, like the grandma in the book, and was a woman that I didn't you know know that well. She was alive until uh, she got pretty sick right? and I came to live with us. So I think Grandma and Claude's relationship was built around me imagining that it was just me and this like woman right? that I didn't really know like what happened if like I was raised with her. Mm. Um, so that's where like that relationship came and then the other pieces uh, coming together was just around messing with our ideas of nuclear family. Like, uh, Paul is ostensibly like Claude's dad. But, mm-hmm. um, after Claude's dad leaves me, he's really young, uh, and like Paul is not what you would consider a traditional father. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Not but, at all. Uh, but the role he plays, um, uh, like, is the role of father, you know, like giving support when it's needed. A good father plays. Yeah. Giving support when it's needed. Giving love when it's needed. What I loved about Paul's character is even when he says things to Claude that are just really heartbreaking. I'm kind of like momentarily cruel because you, you feel like it's coming out of his own pain. There's still that tenderness between them, which I think is like really difficult to do, to, to let the reader know that um, on the page that that is, that that's relationship between the two of them is still steady. Um, was really sort of interesting and I, I really like that part of their, like their, their time together on the page. Yeah, funny. yeah, and I think that the, it's allowed to be more tender because mm-hmm. there's not a, uh, because like, I don't think Paul really views himself as a father figure. Right. But I feel like the uh, breaking of norms actually allows for uh, these relationships to veer more on, uh, I don't know, like close friendships, mm-hmm. right? Like, then, uh, like a stern father figure, mm-hmm. traditional kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're, so Claude is really, he's such an interesting character because in the beginning he's so... He's such an innocent kid, you know? And when I was reading it, I was like, you know, they almost want to like cover his eyes for the world because they're like, stay pure, you know, like stay, stay really pure like this. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about um, constructing him as a character and him as, as um, someone sort of moving through this world and how you started to build him as your, as your main protagonist. Yeah, well, I, I didn't want Claude to be exceptional. That was kind mm-hmm. of like the one thing that I, I really set out to 
accomplish when I was creating this. Like, I just want this to be as average a kid like as possible. Why was, up why was that life. important to you that he'd be average? Uh, well, I think it's like the environment, right? Like, I feel like in communities um, like South Shore, like the South Side mm -hmm. of Chicago, um, communities kind of everywhere, uh, certain urban areas like that, um, there is such a pressure on young minority kids in particular, like to be exceptional, mm -hmm. right? Like to uh, be really bright, to be like, uh, athletic, right, to make it to professional And I was like, you know, there are more kids like Claude out there than there are uh, kids that are like playing college basketball, certainly playing like NBA, mm -hmm. or certainly going to like Harvard or, or Ivy League schools. Uh, so I thought Claude represented um, more of the kids that you see like walking around, right, that have stories mm -hmm. like, and just uh, part of writing this book was uh, demonstrating that kid like Claude like has an interesting story right like how they respond to the world is interesting mm -hmm. right and they're exceptional in in non-traditional ways like I, I say like it's not an exceptional person but you know Claude is exceptionally kind mm -hmm. right like he's exceptionally like empathetic yeah right like he really puts himself out there for his friends mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, and he's really hopeful about friendship over and yeah. over again, um, which is actually really refreshing to read in, in, a, in a main character for a book. That, like, he continually has this palpable desire to connect with the people around him, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah and maybe, like, all kind of anxious, shy kids, like mm -hmm. you... Uh, you know, like when Jonah, this uh, like basketball player in yeah. the early book, that, like, just new to town and moves in, uh, like, when he... Uh, is nice to Claude. Like Claude really like latches onto him because like, <laughs> he's he, like yeah. he's just really shy. And doesn't know what to say to people yeah. when they come. And like this cool guy comes in, like wants to be nice, and it's the greatest thing in the world for mm -hmm. Claude. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see, because I have a couple different questions here. I'm thinking about this. The partly the Jonah character. We're talking a little bit about friendship, um, and one of the things I. I that's another thing that I really enjoyed about the novel is, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to think, like, do we have a lot of novels just about, like, friendships between boys of color? Like, we have a lot of novels, I think, about friendships between girls. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, there's a lot of sort of talk about, like, the bonds between girls and friendships and that kind of thing. But I think more recently we sort of talking about those, like, very close friendships that can form between boys. I haven't really seen as much in fiction more recently. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of deciding to depict that, if that was like a conscious choice on, on your part to sort of talk about those bonds. Um, yeah, I mean, friendship has been really important to me. Mm -hmm. right? Like I have some friends in the crowd I've known since I was five years old. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, I think yeah. that that's maybe just a unique personal thing that I do think is like really important, right? especially uh, in times when you're feeling like really alone, right? When the world, uh, the world is too chaotic, um, like friendship's really important. Mm -hmm. to me. It's like always nice to have someone or five or ten people you can get in a group chat with. Yeah. And just, like, <laughs> right. and just say, dude, I'm having a really bad day. Like, uh, can I talk to you about it? Um, so that's probably it's just been really important to me. Um. I had one more sort of question more about um, depicting the violence in this novel. I'm particularly thinking about the, the chapter where Claude is sort of assaulted at school, is beat up at school, um, which again sort of walks that very fine line in voice. Um, and then a little bit later, the, the chapter that's around the riot that happens in this neighborhood and how the people are reacting. So I'm wondering if you can talk about um, decisions to include those two instances in the in the book, and then also how you approach sort of writing about um, those more sort of violent uh, scenes. Yeah, so I guess with uh, the first one, like Claude gets you know bullied at school. That's one of them. I I th think that Claude is um, like the type of kid that gets like bullied at school and like doesn't say anything. Or mm -hmm. He doesn't really stand up for himself um, and kind of the internal damage, like not just the like surface damage, the physical like beating, but the internal damage like that can do to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, like holding uh, that kind of like shame and pain uh, inside yourself, especially like young kids. 
Yeah. Right. And so I, I think like showing Claude uh, dealing with that uh, was important. And then with uh, the riot scenes, like kind of interesting because uh, I was writing that section uh, in like Massachusetts um, when the, I guess when the Mike Brown trial mm -hmm. uh, was kind of ongoing. And then of course, like when, uh, uh, when the verdict was set down and like Ferguson kind of went up in flames. Mm -hmm. like, so, and I, I spent, uh, I went to college in Missouri for two years, like in central Missouri and mm -hmm. um, like knew, uh, back then I was doing some like basketball writing that nobody read. Uh, but, like I knew these like two basketball players like live like near Ferguson, like outside and that kind of ring of suburbs mm -hmm. that's really close. And so, um, that yeah, it really affected me. Mm -hmm. really, like, I guess as it affected um, everyone. And then, uh, so I had those feelings, and like I was wondering. I guess I assume other people had this thought though. Right? Like, so Ferguson is on fire because this injustice happened, right? But uh, like injustices happened in like where I grew up, South Shore, right? like all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, cops killed kids. Right in South Shore, you didn't really hear about it too often, but you kind of would. Uh, and like, I was wondering, well, why in South Shore on fire? Yeah. Like, why aren't people? And there are like reasons for it, right? I think that um, as like I talked a little bit about in the book, like South Shore is uh, for a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh, it's divided on like class lines, mm. pretty strangely. So there's not much like cohesion mm. in the South Shore. There's not like a real sense of togetherness, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, I think that uh, like dampens down anger sometimes. There's not co cohesiveness. Like, mm. There's like, like upper middle class, middle class, lower class, black people living in uh, close proximity to each other. And so what I want to do in the book because I want like make people mad, make them burn it down. Yeah. Right? Like just see like how that felt, and then to see Claude, um, like respond to it in that way. So like, in the book, the a police officer kills an unarmed uh, black boy, which has happened. Like, mm -hmm. in, 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 um, just imagining what that response would be, what it would look like. Right? There's a scene where Claude is like running through and kind of noticing the neighborhood like changing. Right. And, uh, so yeah, that was just, I guess, an act in the fantasy. So, yeah. Or like curiosity, not really fantasy, but curiosity. Yeah, and I love that detail that uh, Paul tries to order take out a formal like, delivery yeah, in the middle of the riot, <laughs> which I, I know people who would try to be that. <laughs> 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 I know. I know. Yeah. Some people would try to be that, but yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about writing about South Shore of Chicago, about writing about this neighborhood that a lot of garners national attention? It's often in the in people talking about uh, on the national stage, but like a lot of places that people assume they know, um, I think most people who who aren't from there don't really know the actual sort of details and nuances of the neighborhood. So can you talk a little bit about? putting that space onto the page and what you wanted to include and sort of what you were, what, if anything, you were writing in conversation with. Yeah, uh, well, I think, like, in terms of being in conversation with something, um, probably being in direct conversation with Stuart Dybeck mm -hmm. is how it started, or, like, Dybeck stories about Chicago and about these particular neighborhoods. And I just wondered why I didn't read stories like that about or the neighborhoods that... Mm -hmm. Like I saw every day, but it seemed interesting enough, right? Like he mentioned, not to do that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is—it's an interesting and misunderstood place because right? like Michelle Obama uh, grew up, what, like seven blocks down, something that way. My sisters are here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think like on Euclid Avenue, right, like the first chapter, and, um, and so you can't think of a, a more example of like black excellence yes. right, yeah. than, yeah. <laughs> than yeah. Michelle Obama, right, and uh, they live in my park close by. Um, like when I was in high school, too, it was during the just general violent spike in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, like South Shore. Uh, was one of the most, um, like statistically, one of the most violent neighborhoods in the city, right? Just in terms of like violent crimes, uh, murders. 
And like I was saying earlier, uh, and I talk about in the book, right? There's this neighborhood, the Jackson Park Highlands, where like grandma, her mom, Paul, and Claude like live. Um, it's like kind of like an enclave, you know, like a middle middle class, upper middle class, like enclave, uh, surrounded by this other place. Still, you know, like ninety nine percent African American, um, and those dynamics were always interesting to me, and are, and are still interesting mm. to me, right? Like how uh, class operates, like within within race, uh, is like pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and so trying to like talk about those things, approach those things in a subtle way like in the book kind of drove like how I want to depict it. Yeah. Right, because when, like for example, when uh, the gang comes around, like trying to recruit kids, right, uh, it's a little unspoken, but like Claude, you know, doesn't necessarily have to go, like join the criminal organization, yeah. right, because like uh, he doesn't have like a family to try and support, right, like uh, mm-hmm. he's somewhat like interested in who has a support system yeah. behind him. He knows he's going to college, yeah. right? like that's just like a given. Is going to college. Yeah, and he has an adult to say, his grandma to say, like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah like when the gang member comes, like the grandma, you know, I remember when he was a boy, he was like a clown. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. So you don't have to listen to what he says. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, so, um, as grandma, as grandma would say. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier the stories of uh, Stuart Dybbuk, so I'm wondering if you can talk about what. Um, books you were reading that influenced you while you were writing this or um, sort of uh, any of your or general sort of influences for you as a writer? Yeah, uh, well, Dybeck, you know, I think was a real early influence because right, he was writing. Uh, like, I think if you read all of, like, Bubbly and Nugget, the chapter I read from, mm-hmm. you can see, you know, some just Dybeckian right? <laughs> yeah. kids, kids talking wise. Uh-huh. Uh, it's like falling in love. It's pretty Dybeck. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, like, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Mm-hmm. Right? And, um, like the second half of the book takes place in Missouri. And I think that like that move was pretty informed by Invisible Man. Mm-hmm. Like this change of setting. Uh, and um, seeing how that's important for people. Right? Like change setting in drastic ways. Uh, well, I mean, Susan Laurie Parks. Mm-hmm. Like, um, with her and August Wilson. Like I've read everything mm-hmm. they've written. And, uh, I hope that someday like I can like dialogue it's like close to how they just yeah. can get a real sense of people just by the way they speak yeah. um well, I said earlier you love you Charlie Freeman um and then let's see well Ad- Adam Levin uh, mm. was one of my professors at the Art Institute of Chicago yeah. and his massive book I think like the way that our books look couldn't be more different like he writes these, he has one coming out in April, like these massive, interesting, like 900 page mm. uh, tones. And uh, the guy, like, you know. <laughs> 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 uh, but I think, in terms of, like, he's like funny. Mm-hmm. Right? I think that when I'm being funny, I'm mm-hmm. kind of like tapping into it. Yeah. 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 Let's go back, check my list of questions. Um, what was the most surprising thing that you found while working on this novel? Any time when the character surprised you or the writing it surprised you? Um, I guess how hard writing endings are. (laughs) 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 I think that kind of of surprised me. Uh, But no, I guess we know that's hard. Uh, I mean, Claude surprised me. Mm -hmm. I did it a a few times. Uh, Paul always surprised me. Mm-hmm. He always seemed to surprise me with the wacky things he was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe probably the most surprising thing is like how important uh, Janice is to the book. Janice is a female character that's introduced um, pretty early, early on in the book, and then her and Claude like, stay together. Uh, not surprising that she is important, but surprising like. She is the book, mm. right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, but there is really no book without Janice. And I think that, uh, yeah, Alexa is right here. Um, when we were like drafting and like working on edits, that's a realization we came to together. Mm-hmm. Right? Is that, uh, like, uh, like, man, this, this person is amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, she needs to be here, not just in the first uh, 
I don't know, 140 pages. Like she has to be there up until you know, page like 270 or something. And she's there until the end. So that kind of stuff is like fun. Right? It goes back to like which relationships are like so important that they can't go away. Yeah. Right. And the other relationships tend to fade, but the college relationship with Janice uh, is their glimpses fading but just doesn't go away mm-hmm. you're safe mm-hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about sharing with friends and so I'm wondering if you can talk about just sort of it was perhaps it's backwards to ask this question I'm getting, but um, <laughs> if you can talk about uh, sort of getting inception of the book where you sort of started the book um, and sort of your, your art for yourself of writing because you started it when you were in undergrad, is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so, can you talk a little bit about the sort of initial thing that led you to write this, I guess, when you realized that you were sort of working on a novel, um, and then sort of uh, the trajectory of working on it? Yeah. Um, so I think, again, uh, the original seed was uh, like Grandma and Claude. Mm-hmm. Like, like for an undergrad class, I wrote a story about Grandma and Claude, and then, um, like all kind of creative writing students, you're on deadlines. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me write more stories about these characters I seem to like. Uh, and then, um, like, I got into grad school, um, like, based off of a big chunk with just like Grandma and Claude. And then I got there, and um, my ultimate like, thesis advisor, like Jeff Parker, was like, dude, I think this is a book. I was like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I just like wrote a bunch of short stories with these characters, mm-hmm. and, like like jump in time, time and move, and I got to you know you get to 115 pages or something. And I'm like okay, whatever, this is this is a book. Yeah. Uh, and then just like wrote it till the end. I like, kept writing and writing, um, and then with uh, with like Alexa, uh, we tried to work or like worked on you know, the second half of the book a lot. Because I knew it was, again, it was really important for me that Claude leaves Chicago and goes to Missouri. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that, like, in this final version, the first, like, the Chicago portion, like, nothing of that has changed much since, uh, like, the early drafts. Like, grad school, like, that just kind of came out. Um, But, like, we worked hard on, like, the second half to try and get it to, to flow right, to get it together. Um, and, you know, all this took, what, uh, all together, like, eight years or something. Mm, like that. Wow. Right, like, uh, and did you only work on this for the eight years, or were you writing other stuff as well? Uh, if I was, I've, I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's kind of been my life. Uh, yeah. Whatever, my, for my short, my short life. <laughs> most of it's been spent on this thing. <laughs> Uh, but now, um, now I'm, I'm like working on other stuff. Okay. Now, so it's kind of nice. Do you um, prefer to be working with short fiction or novels, or do you feel like you can go back and forth between the two? Um, well, I can. I think novels, and I don't really know. Um, like writing short stories is a talent. Mm-hmm. I guess. Like, do you, have you tried writing short stories? Do you like? I am not. No, I'm like terrible at writing short stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um, it's like a really particular mm-hmm. skill. Yeah. Set that, like I don't uh, think comes like naturally yeah. to me. I think like novels uh, mainly because like you. I think the goal with like novels is you get all these pages down, or right? you get like these stack of big pages. You follow a story from beginning to end, and you just have all this mess at the end to like uh, to cut, to mm-hmm. change. I don't. I like just the amount of uh, material you have to work with at the end of like the first draft yeah. of a novel, even if you end up like cutting half of it and rewriting it, yeah. um, which seems like now like saying that give myself like an anxiety attack. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like oh my God, I have another mm-hmm. novel to like do this to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like that's exciting. It's fun to like, come back to everything yeah. every day and watch it grow. Yeah, for sure. So. <laughs> do we have, is it question time or? It looks like it's it is time. as you walk closer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, over there. Hey, what's up? Hey, man. Uh, I know this guy. <laughs> uh, so one of my favorite things about the novel is uh, the way 
time functions in it. Um, you, there's part of the uh, excerpt you read where you know it jumps forward to the like the parachute accident, yeah. and uh, I love how time sort of accelerates and decelerates throughout the novel. And I, I was wondering if, if that's a thing you feel in the rhythm of writing, or if that was a sort of part and parcel of your approach from the beginning, uh, like when to sort of jump forward in time to these sort of ancillary characters and what they end up doing, and then uh, even within the course of a sentence. You know, months will pass, years will pass. Uh, like, what was your approach to time in the book? And also, as a part two, and I'll take this answer off, Mike. Uh, if you can give me any anything to feel good about the New York Knicks about, like, I, I'll, I'll take that answer later. But we'll talk yeah, about that. I mean, you gotta take that Knicks talk somewhere else. I think. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Bulls have enough to worry about. <laughs> but yeah, hey Andrew, nice to see. You. Um, I think like time, especially in the early chapters, I think that time, like jumping happens, happens a lot. Uh, mainly because I think they're originally conceived as like short stories, right? And I love when that happens in short stories. Like I love when um, like uh, time in short stories is big, right? Like we're not just messing with. So I guess like when you fast forward to like Nugget uh, falling out of an airplane, like when he has an eraser in his mouth, like that kind of juxtaposition is really nice. Like getting someone's whole life uh, in a short amount of time is interesting to me. I think that's, yeah. Oh, over there. Yeah, are we supposed to call them? Are we supposed to call them people? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm always interested in um, how um, fiction writers think about Endings. How did you know that you were finished? Mm. And um, what was the most surprising thing that came out of this process? Uh, do you want to take this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. How did you know you were finished? Yeah, know do you remember the day that you were like, "I think this is done. Like, I think I'm good." Uh, yeah, I can. think I remember like five days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. I think it, it is hard because you can always go back and change something, right? I, um, I feel good that uh, like there isn't much that I'd go back and like change about this book, if like anything at all, actually. Like, I think it's just how it's supposed to be. And I just like write another book, see how that feels. Um, I think the best answer I can give is someone smarter than you tells you <laughs> it's just like you know like uh yeah like they say like alexa told me it was done uh like kathy uh, and i like it was right we sent it to ogonko and like kathy liked it and then uh like uh, kathy was like you know now this is done like and uh, they're just people at different stages you gotta like get this thing out of your hands at some point um be, and like put it in the hands of people you trust but, uh, just say at least like stop thinking about this like go move on to something else mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, hi uh, were there moments throughout this process that you felt like completely giving up and how <laughs> and, well you said eight years is a very long time mm -hmm. and if so how did you not how that not happen and how will you continue to not do that throughout your career as a <laughs> fantastic writer well I, continue, uh, well I hope I have a career yeah that's, probably, <laughs> that's a good place to start um I don't know, like I wanted, I'm sure like you felt this too, like, but there were tons of days I wanted to give up. Um, and just something like happens. So, like, I'm sorry, you, no matter what it is. Like you're just sitting around like, I don't know how, so I thought I'll go get a PhD in history. Like mm -hmm. I don't never want to write fiction again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, especially like around grad school, like after grad school, like what am I gonna do? Like adjuncting, right? Like just driving around, it's like, it's not going to work like it's the plan b um and then you just kind of get i think phone calls that like can pick you up right? you have uh, uh friends like family that was like you know you should do this you should like keep doing this you keep doing it uh but maybe that's something that like as artists we don't talk about mm -hmm. that much is that, like everyone feels like giving up right because like ultimately uh you know we're doing something that's important right? i think doing something that's important 
Um, but you know, it's, if you can't do it, you gotta do something else. So we all think about that every now and then. Uh, and then if you're lucky, you get people to tell you not to. We have time for two more questions. Who's your sister? That's my sister. Yeah, sister. hi. Okay. <laughs> um, I have, I, yeah. I could go into like family business, but I'm not going to do that. Um, hey, I'm not here. I, it's been a little <laughs> while since I read um, the book, but one of the, a couple characters um, who just really stood out to me were in Missouri, actually. This, they weren't in the Chicago portion of the book. And um, one was a journalism, uh, the advisor of the student newspaper in Missouri. And then um, the other one was like, Claude's fellow, you know, freshman reporter. Um, and these are both really interesting um, female characters. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the inspiration for them. Like, I'm obsessed with, wait, what, what's um, Claude's friend's name? Uh, Simone. Simone. Yeah. Which is my middle name. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Right, exactly. Okay. That's, did you know that? It's not, that's no, yeah, my, your middle name, is it? <laughs> say it again? Wait, so, <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you could talk about, um, those, those characters and where they, <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is really weird. Okay. I was going to, I was going to say some, make a joke and just say they're both modeled off of you. But, uh, but I, not, I don't think really I'm not. in this one. Yeah, no, you're not, okay. you're not. Um, no, I think that, uh, like, I, I wrote for my high school newspaper and kind of had, and like, I guess Natalie, sister Natalie, had the same, like, journalism teacher uh, who was of this, like, old dying breed of uh, newspaper people, right? They, like, really uh, felt that uh, reporting was important and, like, the fourth estate was an important thing that had to be upheld no matter what, right? And, like, her... Uh, really principled in that regard, which I think are like important principles to have, um, and that are also just kind of totally off the walls, right? Like uh, Connie Stowe just tells these ridiculous stories about famous people that she's met and done illicit things with, um, and so that's somewhat taken from real life. And I'm just kind of blowing it up, like exaggerating it. Uh, Simone is I think a character that a lot of uh, minority people in predominantly white institutions mm -hmm. uh, like encounter a lot, just like the other minority in the room, right? And it's like, how do you operate like with this person? You're just kind of, you want to be uh, your own person in regard, and you're like both trying to like operate as uh, yourselves, but you know like you're having this shared, um, like experience, right? Often not great experience, right? And like how two separate people that might be totally different from each other, like Simone is totally different than Claude, right? But they have this uh, almost immediate friendship and kinship because of just their position in this institution, in this smaller institution, the newspaper. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that that's just a, uh, that's a common theme I've noticed, right? And especially higher education. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's one I thought was important to talk about. Love you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I have like a two part question. Um, is that you in the cover? And if it's not, <laughs> um, who is that supposed to represent and why did you block out their face like it looks like a minority in a hoodie that we're I'm assuming that's what it's supposed to represent which we you know can relate to Trayvon Martin Mike Brown and all those young black boys so I just want to know the overall theme of the cover uh, yeah that's um I don't think I can answer. I think it's more of the art department's mm -hmm. question. <laughs> uh, no, like I think that um, it does speak. I can't really. Uh, yeah, book covers are yeah, so like trick, such tricky things because we are, you know, we're writers. We're not visual thinkers. I mean, we can be sometimes, but most of us are not. So it's always super interesting with book covers and um, 
figuring out sort of like the design that will speak to your novel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you, you, I mean, obviously you, you have it here, so you have approved the cover and like it and then that sort of thing. Yeah. Was that yeah. an interesting process for you to do? Well, I think through? that like there is um, an artist, uh, like, and I'm forgetting their name right now, that uh, like uses the dot over mm -hmm. like people's faces for like kind of a contemporary artist. Um, I don't necessarily think like it is uh, diminishing the person on the front like very much. I, I think that it reflects kind of their position in society. Right? That was my initial instinct. Right? Like especially someone like Claude who kind of exists as this invisible person, right? Because of who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that it, uh, I think that it like, speaks to that. But you, you had a second part to your question. <laughs> oh, the first question was at me. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, I guess I wear hoodies. But, yeah, no, that's not. Uh, at least I don't think so. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't you wouldn't told. be able to tell. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. Yeah. 